So if we haven't met, my name is Mary Elmquist. Again, I'm the scholarly communications librarian at Musselman Library, and I am here today with Janelle Wurzberger and our great group of panelists who I will introduce to you in just a minute. So we're here today to get some stories of people's experiences with open education and open educational resources or OER from here at Gettysburg. But first, I wanna take just a minute to give you all some context on what this is, what we're talking about and why we think it's important. So to start, I'd like to give a quick definition of OER for those who aren't super familiar. OER are textbooks and other course materials like homework software, test banks, etc., published openly and made available freely. What this means is that OER are available for no cost digitally, although some open textbooks are also available in low cost print versions, and that they're free from copyright restrictions. That latter bit means that OER are often fully adaptable to suit the needs of your courses and your students, something that some of our panelists will elaborate more on today. But I want to go back to that no cost aspect and talk just a little bit about why that matters, locally speaking. So just over a year ago, our team from the library presented another Friday forum on the results from the textbook survey we conducted in fall of 2019. If you weren't there, or if, like me, you can kind of only barely remember what happened two weeks ago, I do want to let you know about just a couple of key things we learned from that survey. So first, in fall of 2019, almost two-thirds of our respondents said that they had spent more than $200 on books for that semester. This didn't include other materials like clickers or lab safety gear, and we found that about 33% said that they'd spent over $400 when those additional materials were included in their count. Second, we found that financial aid didn't put much of a dent into the book costs for most students who filled out our survey. From our whole group, only 8% said that they had anything left to spend on books from their aid package. Even among the Pell Grant recipients in our response group, so those who qualified for this federal grant for students with, quote, exceptional financial need, only 14% had money to spend on books from their aid. With regards to those students with greater need, we looked at how a few specific groups, namely first-generation students and those Pell recipients, worked around and were affected by high book costs. Both groups were more likely than their counterparts who didn't fall into those categories to use strategies that left them with limited or partial access to books to save on costs. And both groups were more likely to say that they struggled academically due to high book costs. First gen students were almost twice as likely to say this as non first gen and Pell recipients were about three times as likely as non Pell students to report the struggle. And finally, it might be helpful to know that when we asked students what they thought was a reasonable price for all materials in a single course, our most common response was $50. So to take a pretty typical example for a student taking four classes, that would be $200 a semester. And as we learned, 64% of our respondents said that they spent more than that in fall of 2019. But with all of that said, I don't wanna be all doom and gloom because we have some stuff to celebrate today too. Recently, our team has been pulling together new and old reports of OER adoptions from Gettysburg College instructors and what we found has been really exciting. So in our data, which goes back to the 2013-2014 academic year, 53 instructors have used OER in more than 40 unique courses. All of these classes together have enrolled more than 3,400 students who've saved on textbook costs as a result and saved they have. Over these last seven years, OER adoptions have saved students at Gettysburg College over half a million dollars by our estimations. And today we're excited to hear more from some of the folks who've made this happen and been directly affected by it. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. So for, first, Dr. Alice Brawley Newland from Management will tell us a little bit about her experiences working in a team to adapt and adopt OER for the introductory business statistics class. Dr. Tasha Generis from Environmental Studies, who's worked with OER in several different formats and contexts, will talk next about past, current, and future OER projects. Then Dr. Chris Eckler in Spanish will give us some insight into how he's been able to combine content from multiple open books to create an OER that worked for his needs. 
And finally, we'll hear from Ryan Nedro, class of 22, who was a student in Professor Brawley Newland's class last semester. So they'll chat a little bit about the student experience in classes using OER. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alice to tell us a little bit about what she's been doing. Thanks, Mary. All right, I am going to pull up my slides. And there we go. Are they, they're showing full screen for you guys too? I'm guessing so. It's a plain white slide, so don't freak yes. out yet. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Um, all right, so I, as Mary mentioned, I uh, have started using OER or One Open Access Textbook in my Management 235 course, along with Marta Maras, who is here, um, and I'm sure would be happy to talk about this experience as well. But I want to start with kind of putting this into context. So this is part of the check sheet for our major uh, in business organizations and management. So you can see 235 is a course that students are supposed to complete by the end of their sophomore year. And in particular, I wanna highlight that statement at the bottom. This is what makes this a little bit infamous in addition to the teaching stats, which is not many students' favorites. Um, we also have a grade requirement to continue in the major and students get one chance. So I, I'm putting this up here to point out that students come into this class taking it very seriously. They know that it's one shot. They really wanna do well. Um, perhaps more so than you know the typical course. And this is also really important to us as faculty. Uh, we work really carefully to make sure everything is very fair across students with so much sort of writing on this class or its important place in the major, both in terms of the grade and in terms of learning the content for the rest of the major to really understand it. Um, we're very careful to make sure that students have equal opportunities in this course. So this was a great place when Marta and I started thinking about whether we wanted to go with open access. I, there's a really strong argument for we need to have our, our resources be equally available to all students. So it was really exciting to be able to go this route and ensure that fairness across all of our students. Um, but that wasn't the only reason why. Um, there are two other big reasons that we considered as well. And so I wanted to talk through those um, just to help folks think about why they might be ready to make this switch. Um, this is the part of my presentation where I will torture you with formulas. Okay, everybody pull out your notebooks. Obviously, I'm kidding. Um, this is sort of intro stats. Uh, three has some common topics that you typically will cover. And these three formulas are three of the ones that you will typically see. I put these up here because I wanna point out these formulas are not new. Um, that first one was proposed in the mid 1800s. Even the newest one, that F formula down at the bottom is literally a hundred years old. So there was also for us no reason why the material in a, a paid textbook made sense. If this is material that's been around for a long time, there are lots of um, lots of things published since then, it, it made sense for us to make this freely available to students. Um, and of course, there is plenty still going on in stats that's changing. But when we were talking about that introductory 200 level course, this is material that has been around for a while and it's pretty well established. So moving to open access definitely made sense content wise. And then the third reason, something that applied to all of us, um, we are in a remote or dispersed learning environment for our students. So to be able to make our text available without any problem for students who were here and then moved home suddenly or anywhere in between was really nice to be able to, to make sure that students didn't have problems with accessing the textbook. So there were three big reasons why, one, really wanting things to be fair across students in terms of academic opportunity. Two, the content is not new. Um, there's no reason for us to be switching editions between 2018 and 2019 and 2020 and so on. And then three, you know, this worked really well for a remote learning environment. Um, for the rest of my comments, I wanted to focus a little bit on the process, um, how we went through it. And I'll focus a little bit on sort of a, a expectations versus reality in terms of things you might want to plan on when you're switching to OER. So as usual, Marta and I went through and reviewed several textbooks and we were thinking we would pick a book we totally love that we would use this um, tool called LibreText, which I believe Chris will speak about uh, to edit the book to be perfect, make a few tweaks and, and just chef's kiss, it would be perfect for our class from there. And then three, we thought we would share that LibreText link to a live uh, version online with students and students would of course be stoked about it. That was expectations. Here's reality. Um, we did not find a book we totally loved. I'll talk about that in a second. 
we did not edit the book to perfection. Um, and then we were not able to, in the end, uh, at least with this iteration of the textbook, share the live version with students, but we were able to convert to a PDF and get that electronic version as well as offer a low cost print version, like Mary mentioned, to students. So we were really happy with the process overall, but there were some hiccups, which I, I said I'd mentioned just to give some pointers about things people might think about or plan for if they're making the move to OER. So first up, we did not find a book we totally loved. We found one we were mostly good with, let's say like 95%. Um, there was one particular topic that was presented in a way that we wanted to change. Um, I went into this thinking that would basically be a find and replace type maneuver. We'd go through the whole textbook and just find where they mentioned this topic in a certain way and replace it with the way that we wanted to say it. It was a little more complex than that. Um, first of all, we realized that we had picked a textbook that was not already in the LibreText library, which was not a problem in terms of getting it imported, but there were some formatting differences between our textbook and the way LibreText likes to format things so that everything can remix very nicely across their library. So it took some extra work and some extra coordination to get our textbook into the format that LibreText um, likes to use across all their textbooks. And I have a picture here. This man is Delmar Larson. He is the founder of LibreText. This man absolutely deserves to be knighted or given sainthood because he dealt with so many emails from myself um, and from Marta in terms of helping us with this process. So I don't want to give the impression that LibreText isn't this amazing tool. It absolutely is. Their staff is wonderful, but there is some, some process that you would have to go through. Um, sort of in the same vein, there was more of a learning curve than I expected. Having a little bit of programming and um, website uh, or HTML experience helped, but it, there was still a learning curve with the LibreText tools in terms of how to edit the book. And Chris might mention this when he talks about LibreText, there was a lot of page forking going on that you might need to get used to. So keep those in mind. It's just, it's a different platform. It's super useful, but it does take some time to get into that platform to start editing. So we did, uh, moving to that second one, we did not edit the book to perfection. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of things in particular if you're editing your book that you might keep an eye out for. Um, so there were several uh, equations being stats course, but that would apply across several other courses too. Editing equations in HTML is intense. So leave yourself some time, be gracious with yourself as you learn this process. Um, we also noticed some changes to fonts across sections, so just something to keep an eye out for. Um, and then editing the tables. I know this is pretty generally applicable across a lot of textbooks. This table, I know you're like, what's wrong with that, Alice? It's a beautiful table. Yeah, that's after like hours of editing. So just keep in mind if you have tables, if you're picky like me about fonts and about uh, your tables looking nice, you're going to need some Kleenex and some, some self-care after you're editing this textbook. Um, so just things, again, it's a great tool, but there are things that you have to get used to in this process. And then the last thing, this is the reason why we ended up uh, going with the PDF of the book in the end, was that the hyperlinks in our textbook were still going back to the original book instead of you know to chapter two in our edited book. And so that's something that, again, we had to work with Delmar to get edited but we ran out of time with the start of the semester. So we ended up going to PDF, which we could easily get to the students and then offered them a very low cost option to print it to the copy shop, or of course they could print it on their own on campus. So overall, happy with the process, but there are some things I would suggest to, you know, to a colleague to think about. Um, just to wrap up some takeaways, leave yourself plenty of time. This is not something that you'll be able to knock out probably. Uh, in the last two weeks of the summer semester before fall. If you're thinking about different sources, there might be some value in considering what's already in LibreText since it would be in the right format, um, as opposed to importing from outside of LibreText, but you can absolutely bring in anything that you like. Just know that there would be those formatting changes that you might need to make. Um, one other thing to point out were some of the things that were different between either the online version and the print or PDF, or just things in general that were missing that we didn't think about that would be important. One was page numbers. We didn't think about page numbers until we were trying to use this to prep for class. 
and trying to communicate to students, hey, the reading starts on page 141 when there weren't page numbers actually printed on the page. So keep an eye out for that. Um, something to think about. And then, then other stuff would just kind of look funny in the text. I noticed, for example, fractions would look like they are on the left in the online version, but then when they would print or be in the PDF, we would get these crazy series of numbers um, that weren't showing up properly and of course led to some confusion. But all of that to say, this has really opened my mind to how much we can continue to change our textbook. So Marta and I have kept a running list of changes that we're going to make in the second round of the textbook. Um, it's just a shared Google Doc and that's been exciting to know that we can either, you know, fix a typo or fix a fraction, but we can also change the way something's presented. Um, and overall, I would absolutely recommend this just to wrap up. We went from having two textbooks for this one course that could cost students up to $300, um, again, to complete this required course for the major. And now we're dealing with either zero or $2 if they're getting it printed through the copy shop on campus. So um, it's, a, it's a big undertaking, but absolutely worth it, in my opinion. Thanks. All right, I think I am talking next. We're gonna take questions at the end, I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm also gonna share some slides, although they're not quite as creative as Alice's. <laughs> Your hard act to follow. Can everyone see my slides? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about two classes that I've used OER in um, because they were pretty different experiences in terms of having something that I liked just to start with versus um, not really having one good source. They're also very different in that uh, the first class I'll talk about is a 100 level class uh, that's mainly non-major students, non-science majors versus a core class in our major where you maybe would have more um, specific expectations for what the students get out of the class. I'll also talk a little bit about involving students and in creating OER as part of this process um, and about some of the maybe not so obvious take home. So of course, saving students money is huge, but there are a lot of other benefits I've found from using OER in my classes. So um, this, this was a case where it was pretty easy for me to adopt OER this class. Just wanna make sure it's someone's. Um, this class was, this textbook was pre-existing on the open textbook library. So I would definitely recommend this as a great place to start um, if you are looking for OER for your classes. And it was available in a lot of different formats for students. Um, mainly they used the PDF format in my class. The textbook was really well written with a lot of nice links to external sources like YouTube videos and stuff like that. Um, and the students really loved it. So these were these were the evalu student evaluations for course materials in that class. And you can see that almost all of the students, one of them really didn't like it, but um, or didn't like something else I created for the class. But all of the students basically either said very good or excellent. And I just pulled out a few of the comments. There were a lot of comment. There were several other comments that were along these lines. Um, so students said that the textbook was free and easy to read. And the other thing I mentioned is that in this class in particular, I noticed a lot that the students were also talking about the other resources that I provided. And I'm gonna come back to that um, later in my presentation as well. So again, um, talking about the different types of materials and appreciating saving money on the textbook. So I didn't have any complaints about this textbook um, and actually had a lot of positive comments. There was a gap, however, um, this textbook was not perfect. So the gap in this was that um, the textbook was made for a class that didn't actually need students to know marine ecology or conservation because they were taking another class that focused on this. So this was created for a specific class at Roger Williams. Um, and because of that, it was made to fit the needs of that class. But I want to cover marine ecology and conservation in my class. That's my focus as a scientist. And I think one of the things that really invites students into oceanography is thinking about ecology and um, particularly the bigger stuff like seabirds and whales. 
So what I've actually done to help fill this gap, and this is something I'm in the process of doing right now, uh, is I'm teaching a 300 level course right now. So these are experts in marine ecolo in ecology um, and the class is marine ecology. And so instead of having midterms and a final exam in that class, the students are working in groups to create a thorough uh, open textbook chapter that covers all aspects of the ecology, oceanography, and the conservation of a specific type of marine system. So upwelling systems or coral reef systems. And those chapters will actually get added to this textbook when I teach the 100 level class again. So I did a little bit of this last semester, which I'll come back to. And there were definitely some lessons learned there. One of them being um, definitely having these checkpoints throughout the semester and other places to help improve the quality of those chapters before getting to the end product. So again, uh, like I mentioned, the students have different checkpoints and each of these are kind of like a midterm for this. So they're all working on this now and I'm excited to combine this using LibreText uh, to create a more comprehensive textbook for when I teach the 100 level class again. So this is one example of where I've involved students in creating OER. Uh, the next class I'm going to talk about is another example of that. So like I said, this is a 100 level non-majors class. The other class that I'm going to talk about is Principles of Ecology, which is a 200 level class. That's a core class in our major in environmental studies. There was no good one textbook for this, which was surprising to me, but there were several different options that I could pull from. Um, like Alice, I did run out of time to actually really create a comprehensive textbook, except I ran out of time much earlier in the process. So one of my hope streams for this summer is to create a comprehensive textbook out of these various um, open textbooks that are available on the open textbook library I showed earlier. So this was a case where I did kind of have students reading from several different textbooks. Um, I would just each time I assigned something, I would put the link for that textbook on Moodle, even though they were all at the top, so they could go straight to it to try to reduce confusion. I will say that I didn't actually have any complaints from students about this kind of approach to using textbooks. I did pull back a little bit on readings um, last semester as well because students seemed really overwhelmed and I had been trying a flipped format, so they were watching videos before class. But this summer, I do hope to combine these sources using LibreText. Another thing I rely on really heavily in this class is using open software and open data sets. Um, so I use R in, my, in most of my classes, except my 100 level class. Uh, and I did want to mention one great tool for finding data sets that I somehow just found um, a year or so ago. Google actually now has a open data set search option. So if you are looking to use open data in your classes, um, that's a great way to find open data sets. So to come back to again involving students in OER, the big final project in that class focuses around students finding an open data set that they're interested in, developing hypothesis, and then testing that hypothesis using R. And what I actually plan to do is every year build out um, a collection of ecological case studies. I realize that I'm sharing my PowerPoint and not my screen. So let me fix that so that you can see this when I bring it up. So these are all um, basically one page summaries of what the students did for their final project. But the cool thing is that uh, they all wrote this really well commented, highly functional code that recreated all of the analyses and um, figures in their study. And so when we publish this on the cupola, um, anyone who wants to use this to teach R in their ecology classes can actually click on these links and go straight to the code and the data set that was used and use these R notebooks in their classes. And um, here is an example of one of the well described commented R notebooks. So just to summarize, um, 
Some of the maybe less obvious things that I found using OER is that when students aren't paying for a textbook, I feel much less obligated to cover everything in that textbook in the order the textbook has it in. And I think it does provide a lot of flexibility for integrating other types of resources like primary literature and podcasts, um, because you don't feel like you have to kind of get students their worth out of that textbook. So that's been really one of my favorite things about using OER in these classes. Um, you, involving students in OER has been a lot of fun and they have been very motivated um, by the idea of publishing. So the, uh, this resource I was just showing you, they all worked on that over winter break if they wanted to publish to get it up to publication quality. Um, using OER I found can also encourage more general discussions about equity in STEM with my students and about open scholarship in general. So things like open publishing and open data and open software. And then lastly, I'll mention that OER is not just about textbooks. Um, this has come up a few times, but that using real open data sets, uh, I found that to be really useful for teaching data literacy in my classes. And um, teaching open software allows the students to then take those skill sets and use them wherever they go, even if they don't have access to um, the paid software anymore. Um, and that was all that I have. So I will pass it on to Chris. Okay, everyone, I hope you can see my PowerPoint slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience using span using an open textbook in Spanish 301. Uh, thanks to Mary and Janelle for inviting me onto this panel. Um, so let's get moving. So why open? Why did I choose to use an open textbook for this course? Well, first of all, Spanish 301 is a required course for both our majors and our minors in conjunction with Spanish 302. Um, so any, any student who's looking to major or minor in Spanish will go through this course. Um, also, we do have students who take this course to complete their language requirement, uh, depending on how high they test into Spanish, they might start at 202 or they might even start at 301 for their language requirement. So it's a course that a lot of students pass through and we can see a lot of savings that way. And also, on a more personal level, the coronavirus caught me kind of mid stride doing research in Spain. So I had to scurry out of that country and land here at home to realize that I can no longer do research during my pre tenure research leave. So in an effort to be somewhat productive, I decided to turn to the turn to the open textbook and try to make something useful for my students. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the process of remixing. Alice has talked about this a little bit, um, but the process itself is very simple. Um, we'll, we'll see this in a minute, but all you need to do is find a text or two or more, preferably on LibreText that you would like to use. You pull out the chapters that you're interested in, and then you move them into your own your own book. You reorganize the chapters however you want to organize them, and you have basically a new text from these existing texts. Like Alice mentioned, it's nice when they're on LibreText because they have their own system, their own ways of, of working this system. Um, if they're not, you can always talk to Delmar and you know, whenever I send an, an email, Delmar was always there. So he does deserve to be knighted or sainted or something. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about Delmar and some some scary situations that we had or that I had at least uh, in this process. So I'd like to share another screen right now. I'm going to share my LibreText screen. So you should now see my browser. Um, so when you enter into LibreText, you can kind of go to the bookshelves to see what's out there. So if we click through the bookshelves, um, it's organized kind of by division or topic, I guess. Um, and it, I go through humanities to languages, down into the Spanish language. 
And then you can browse around and see what's out here. So you can see there are some um, language textbook textbooks here, and there's also some literature textbooks. One of the textbooks that I really liked was this one. And so if you're considering using an open textbook, but you don't maybe don't have the time to remix, you could just send your students to these textbooks that are already existing. Um, you could choose the specific chapters you want them to look at. Um, and this also, when you're exploring this, it might give you ideas of things to share. So I've located a textbook that I really like. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna use some parts of this textbook, some parts of other textbooks into my remix. So then we go over to the remixer. Um, and when you're when you have a Libre Tech text account, all you do is click on remixer. It'll bring up this this remixing tool, um, and you'll find your book. So, for example, I went into bookshelves, languages, um, down to Spanish, and then I found this book that I was interested in, and then I choose the area. So, let's say I want my students to learn a little bit about the subjunctive. That's going to be an important topic for us in the course. It's really just as easy as dragging and dropping into your new area. So I could drop this as part of a chapter. I could drop it in as its own chapter. Um, there's a lot of different options here. So let's say I'm gonna drop it right there. Okay, well now this is here. This exists now within my text. You can go in and change the title um, and kind of get it to the way you want it to be. So that's the most basic level of remixing. Um, I can show you now some of the things that I've done and I, I can talk about some snags in a minute. But if you see, you can come in here to the remix area. And once you come in here, Alice mentioned this briefly, but you need to fork your pages to be able to edit them. So let's say I'm going to go in here to La Narración. You can see I have several pages in here. So let's say I'm gonna work on the preterite tense. And I have forked this page. So now I can go in here and edit and I would click on the edit button and I can go in and edit at the text level um, and work with some of these tables that Alice mentioned can be a real headache um, and add other things here. And this was very important to me because in the book that I really like this, this Spanish, um, Spanish grammar, you can see this author presents everything in Spanish and also in English. Um, and the methodology I like to follow is to try to keep everything in the target language, especially at the 300 level in Spanish. So for me, the English was was not something that I wanted in my textbook. So I went through on any pages I took from this author, I would go through and delete all the English and then change some of the Spanish where, where I thought it needed to be adapted a little bit to meet my students' needs. Um, Another thing that was interesting with this is that you can add your own pages. So I ended up doing that. There were no open textbooks on LibreText or elsewhere that had some topics that I wanted to cover in my class. So with the help of, you know, our handy dandy reference materials that I have still sitting on my desk here at home, um, I was able to kind of create my own my own chapters on different topics so that I could work through those topics with my students. So let me return for a moment to my PowerPoint. Um, okay, here we go. So some of the snags with LibreText, the formatting, Alice mentioned this, it was a huge headache. Um, it, it really takes a lot of time getting used to the system. That's not to say that that it does it isn't worth it to do it, but you need to plan at some time, especially if you're if you're really interested in in the way your textbook will look in the end for your students and how they will how they will interface with that textbook. The other huge snag, and this was this was huge for me, is that LibreText does not like written accents, diacritical marks. So even in the most simplest word in Spanish, yes, you can see we have one of those important accents. And accents are very important in written Spanish. And, and we try to make the case that they're very important to our students as well. So it was really unacceptable to me to have a textbook without written accents in and then turn around and tell my students on all of their compositions, no, I have to take points off because you gave me a word without an accent, which actually makes it into a different word. 
So, um, or a different, maybe a different verb tense if the accent is missing. So, you know, that was a big, something that happened. Um, it's, it's okay at the page level and the text level, but when you start to title your pages. So for example, um, one of my pages was titled La Narración, La Descripción. These things, these words have accents in them. And what happens is the LibreText system doesn't read them and hides them from you. So I spent a lot of time preparing my textbook. And then one day I went in and all my pages were gone. And so that's when I had to call on Delmar to rescue me. Um, and he, he showed up on his, on his steed and, you know, did the things he needed to do to get my books back. But he said, you know, I think the accents are a problem. So just leave them out. Um, that was kind of unacceptable to me. I found a workaround, but so the, the book that I had published under, under the Gettysburg college area that, um, that you could find on LibreText isn't the book I actually used in class. I actually used a PDF like Alice did because that was the best way for me to do it um, with the accents in the places that they should have been in. So just to kind of round out some student reactions, some things I hadn't, I hadn't thought about before I made this book is that students really were excited that we used the entire textbook. Um, you know, before I would kind of pick and choose maybe different areas to look at skip over some parts that I didn't think were were related to the class and students caught on to that and said you know this this was great that we used the entire textbook um, they liked that the style meshed a little bit better between my teaching and the book obviously because I I compiled this book I made some of the chapters as well I wrote some of the chapters so there was a lot of a lot of um, similarities um, they mentioned money of course and then also some other ideas, um, since we were using a PDF and this would have been the same on the web, they could do a quick search. Since it wasn't a physical book, they could just hit control F and find whatever topic they wanted to find and be able to study that, read about that topic quickly. Um, and then some other, some other reactions. One student said the experience did not feel too different. Um, I guess that's a good thing, maybe, that it didn't feel too different. So that would be an interesting conversation to have with the students. Um, one student preferred having hard copies. I didn't really point them anywhere to print this out to save the trees, I guess. But um, I do recognize that some students might prefer hard copies. So that's something for me to think about in the future. And so one student said they liked the formatting, but they thought that a larger text size would be helpful. Um, so if we, well, I'll take a look at this in a minute. You can see the PDF, how it, how it printed out. But so moving forward, just some ideas for me. Um, I'm thinking about maybe moving my textbook to a different platform where I have a little bit more control over how it how it appears and how it functions and how accents work within it. Um, I'd like to add some new sections for my course into this textbook. And also something I'm really, really excited about are H5P exercises to just take a quick second to show everyone what these are, the H5Ps. Um, you should, I, the sk shared screen should have jumped back to my browser. Um, the, the PDF looks like this. Um, you really don't have a lot of control over font size. So my student, I understand my students complaint that the font is rather small, but I, there was no way around doing that the way the, the, the program works on, on LibreText. And then finally, the H5P exercises are these types of interactive exercises where you can drag and drop your ideas into these boxes. Whoop, I got one right and I got one wrong. You can give students immediate feedback. And I'm really excited about these exercises because the newest iteration of Moodle will allow us to tie these exercises directly to the gradebook. So I can create these exercises and have them set up for homework tied directly to Moodle's gradebook. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Thanks, Tasha and Alice. You guys have given me some great ideas moving forward as well. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I like envisioning Delmar on a, a white steed. I think next up is myself and Ryan. And it looks like he's set. Cool. Um, so Ryan are, and I are going to have a you know a short discussion about his experience having taken my course with uh, an open an open textbook. So Ryan, just kind of start. I mean, where were you prior to the start of the class? Were you aware of OER? Um, had you taken a class that used an open textbook before? 
I honestly had never heard of open educational resources before this class. You know, uh, while I went to public school, I uh, assumed that textbooks were free and provided for students, but I knew that from my parents that at college you had to pay for your books. And that was just my assumption going into things. I always tried to use sites like Gabe's books or other sites to, you know, get the best deal, be thrifty about it. And, you know, I was quite surprised and I, in fact, delighted when I heard that we were using OER for the, for the, for the class. And, um, you know, actually to continue this into my current class in anthropology for my capstone, we're actually using an OER book. Uh, we're using an anthropology of anthropology by Borofsky. And uh, he makes it a point to provide his works in an OER format for the public at large. I think that's great. It's, it's given me some ideas too. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about what was your reaction when you learned that the book was free and open for the class? I was excited to say the least. I mean, like I, you know, I, sometimes you have to commit to buying a book and then you think, well, shoot, will I ever read this again? Mm -hmm. And in fact, I going into this, I had a very negative view of statistics. I, I, it was like the math that I was willing to tolerate and um, as, a, as a humanities person. But after going through it, I'm like, well, shoot, if I had chosen to rent this book, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go back and reference it later when I needed it. Mm -hmm. So it solves both dilemmas, having something in an OER format. So, yeah. Yeah. And I love statistics now. So. It, it changed your life. I'm so glad yes. to hear it. <laughs> um, what differences would you say you've seen between this course and, and you mentioned the other, um, others that aren't using an open textbook? Yeah, so definitely um, I see that students are generally happier. I know when we learned that we were using OER and that we had like a free textbook, the word, you know, free kept you know, resounding with students. And that's, you know, as generally college students who are looking for a deal, they're looking to be thrifty. They want this option, but it also solves some other dilemmas, like I said previously, and it brought up ethical questions about how to charge people for common knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think those are big questions. I'm excited. I think both Tasha and Chris touched on this. It's, it's mm -hmm. nice to get to consider those issues in a broader sense uh, with with all of our classes. Um, and you mentioned using that open text in your anthropology course too. Have you noticed any differences, at least so far, um, in the ways OER is or could be used across different disciplines? Yeah, so I know that in the sciences, it's uh, generally considered that there's concrete forms of common knowledge that have been practiced for centuries. You know, uh, Cohen's D will always be Cohen's D. You know, there, there will always be a periodic table. We should always have access to these things just for the, the general student to be able to learn um, and advance as scholars and build that future generation of scholars. And while there's still innovation, there is this common knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the difference I saw in the humanities was one of secondary sources and interpretations. So primary sources should be easily accessible. This could be a diary of a soldier or a battlefield report. Usually by the time of our present, those sources have flown up into the public. Um, but a secondary source is more of like one's intellectual property. And that is a personal choice on the author to share that knowledge and interpretation in an OER format. And this is what Borofsky does in an anthropology of anthropology. Yes, that's the real title. Say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the textbook for your anthropology course. Yes. Um, so would you recommend courses to other people when, you know, courses like these that are using open textbooks? Would you recommend those to other students and why or why not? Well, of course I would. I mean, I'm on the panel, but um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to give a glowing review. And of course, like as a thrifty person who likes to deal and as a scholar who wants a more ethical transfer of knowledge, I definitely agree. I can see this being a great future for students and for education at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I'm glad to be able to see this perspective developing in you as a student as well. Um, are there any other reflections, you know, on your experience in general as using OER that you want to share, maybe for other students, for professors, or, you know, anyone who's here today? Um, well, actually, uh, Professor um, Chris, uh, you stole my comment on control F and the find function. Uh, I was <laughs> going to hark on this. It's a great function for digital format. And it's vital that it actually brings up the point that uh, this powerful tool and so many others mean that OER has to work hand in hand with digitization. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, but the, um, I, you know, I understand that some students prefer a hard copy textbook, for the tactile thing. That's something that uh, is a learning style that people have, and that should certainly be an option. Print out PDFs to uh, give that as an option. But 
as OER, you know, moves into the future, as we, you know, want to have uh, ourselves free from physical books and the cost of materials as well, um, we have to also look at like um, the ability to edit and keep the source up to date, as we've mentioned, mm -hmm. and going into a modern age with like pressing environmental concerns. Uh, that also means that we should look at a digital OER future. Um, I actually, I'm looking at a career in the digital humanities. So this is, I will hark on this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's really brought to light all the different value uh, of this for different audiences. So mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Of course, thanks for joining us, Ryan. And uh, so I think at that point, we'll hand it back to Janelle and Mary. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, all of our panelists. Like, this has been a really great chat. I've learned a lot just listening to y'all in the past, like 50-ish minutes, 45-ish minutes. Um, so just really quick before we take questions, um, I do want to take a second to plug the JCCTL OER grants, which are accepting applications from now um, up until April 2nd. Thank you, Yosef. Um, so these are grants that you can use if you're interested in adopting or adapting OER for your own courses. They do require a consultation with either me or with Janelle. Um, but if you do have any questions about this, please do not hesitate to get in contact with either of us, with Yosef, um, and we will help you out and answer any questions or set up a chat or whatever. But please apply to those if this sounds interesting to you. And with that, I, I guess we'll open things up for questions. Oh, David. <clears throat> yes, um, most of this is, you know, OER stuff as well from material, um, copyright free is, or whatever the term would be. But what if you would like, as you are editing, put, put in some material that is copyrighted? What issues do you have uh, involving that, involving using material that's copyright, copyrighted in your own text. So I don't know if any of our panelists even tried anything like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know if we have any, any direct experience with that in here in general. Um, I know that there are sort of there are some some folks who like to make the case that you can make a fair use argument for using some copyrighted materials in an open textbook. And there are some folks who really kind of s sort of err to the no, let's make sure everything's in the textbook is also published openly. And that's a conversation that's ongoing. Um, I think different people have different takes on it. There's cert a certain amount of risk assessment associated with it. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Just to maybe add a little bit about that too, the um, even if things are are copyright free, they might be licensed, have a certain Creative Commons license to them, and not all licenses mix well together. And that's something I found out in this process. So for example, you find one book on one site that you really like. And so that book says you have to share their book with the same license. And then you find another book that you really like, mm -hmm. but that book has a different share license. And that means you can't really combine those two books. I mean, you can leap through some hurdles to do it, but it's not just as easy as, okay, this one's open, this one's open, let me put them together. You really have to pay attention to the different licenses. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so this is a question partly for Tasha, but uh, anyone else. So a, lo a lot of the textbooks that I use are, are very visual. They have a lot of um, graphs, maps, other kinds of graphics, figures. Um, so I, I wondered specifically, Tasha, when, with what you're doing in your class, um, the, the chapters that the students are working on, do they have graphics? And how are you dealing with that? Are the students drawing graphics? Or are you using open source? illustrations from other places uh the student the when they were creating resources or the resources they were when they were creating resources yes yeah, yeah. so the students in your 306 class that are creating them for your oceanography class so google has a great tool that you can use to find um if you go to do image searches you can mm -hmm. actually look at only creative commons commons images 
Um, and then you have to just basically attribute them using um, a format that Janelle taught me called Tassel, um, which you basically say the name by this person with this license. Um, but there are lots of open source graphics out there that people can use. And there's actually also a great um, open source icon resource called the Noun Project. Um, and so a lot of them use that as well. But uh, yeah, a lot of it comes through Wik Wikimedia Commons. Mm -hmm. So I always recommend students start there. Um, they can also create their own graphics. So I'm also teaching students R with open data sets in my marine ecology class. So some of them I imagine will wind up using stuff that they created in R for another assignment in their chapters as well. But um, yeah, Google image search, if you go to tools, you can look and specifically look for only open source or Creative Commons images. Oh, that's Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So we've got a quick, quick question from Yosef in the chat. Um, he was wondering if any of our panelists uh, designate your classes as zero or low cost in your course descriptions. I don't, but I, I would love to. Um, I, Yosef, I'm wondering, are you talking about in the syllabus or, or where are you talking about? I'm talking about the time of course selection. I'm wondering if there's mm -hmm. students who would be really helped by having a choice yeah. between a $300 stats class and a $0 stats class. Right. Well, I think too, you know, it makes me think of the fact that, you know, this is the first year we've used open education resources, but I imagine the word spreads quickly, uh, like it does with many things among students. But I would think, uh, that could be one way of getting the news around, but yeah, absolutely. It would be cool to put that in the course descriptions, maybe, you know, as a whole, if they, it could be all the course listings in, in our um, search function. Yeah, and I'll just add something that um, that Janelle brought up in the chat as well, that this is this is a practice at some colleges and universities called course marking, where they do have a space in the course catalog when students sign up for classes where it is marked if a class is no cost or low cost. Um, and yeah, I think it, it's, it is a really neat sort of systemic practice that would be really cool to see implemented more widely for sure. Ryan, out of curiosity, how do you normally go about figuring out course costs? Is that, you know, word of mouth? Is it the bookstore? Is it where, where's that info coming from? Um, usually there's, there's not much of it. It's, it's kind of on a professor to professor basis. You know, gotcha. you got, you get a feel for which professors assign more reading, less mm -hmm. reading, different types of books. I know it would be different in the humanities because we're, we're typically dealing with like, um, secondary sources and few scholars have made this jump toward OER, at least in the humanities. Um, I know that the sciences might be a bit different. Um, but, uh, as far as the students knowledge, if you can find an upperclassman who's really got to get rid of their books, that <laughs> is a concept. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, it is 12.58. I feel like we might have time for one more question if anyone has, has one. I suppose seeing none, thank you to everyone for being here today. Thank you so much to, for, to our panelists for being willing to come in and talk today about your experiences. Um, this has been really great and I hope that everyone has had a, a, as good of a time as I have over the last hour. And thanks everybody for presenting. This is always one of the like most favorite panels of the year when you guys talk about OER stuff. So I really appreciate the way it's grown and and um, and developed. And so thanks to the faculty who've been using these. Thanks to Ryan to talk to us about a student perspective because I think that's really important. Um, and thanks, you know, Janelle and Mary for doing this work. This has been a labor of love for a long time. So, and yeah, Janelle, happy OER week to everybody. Um, so thank you. Uh, we will see you guys back next week. Remember, Mia is gonna talk about education and disaster, Fukushima. So we hope that we will see you here again and enjoy the weekend. Get outside maybe. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, it was awesome. I feel like yeah, this is normally you. the 
the Friday forum that I come and fangirl at. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's exciting to get to, to be on this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that question that Yosef asked, we had talked about that, um, putting yeah. some kind of designator in so cool. the, um, when, you know, when students sign up for courses. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, I, I think students would really appreciate that. Um, and we do have a lot of faculty who may not be doing OER, but they work really, really hard to yeah. like, they choose their sources and they're just like, you know what, I was going to have my students read this book, but it was so expensive that I couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't see it. Um, I know that happens a lot with lit with lit faculty. So um, right, and you know there are people like us in Africana Studies who don't. We've never seen a textbook we actually like, and so we do a lot of um, you know we use a lot of articles and and that yeah, kind of thing. Like so yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like make your own OER, like you guys have been doing. So um, so thanks. Bye, y'all. We really appreciate thanks for, it. Thanks for letting us use this platform to share with campus. We really appreciate it. Always, always. And, you know, word of the year, I think, is amplify. So if we can ever amplify this kind of stuff for you in different ways, let me know. Um, because, you know, I'm always looking for for uh, different projects to, to bring to our faculty. Um, you know, and obviously, Yosef has been great with this, too. So just let me know what we can do. OK, thanks, Jess. All right. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Coming, Dave. Bye, everybody. Bye.